All right. So um, with that, we've got three speakers with us today. Uh, Mr. Vince Massimini, if I said that correctly, Joanna Ford, and Carrie Bedsworth. And uh, Vince is a GA pilot uh, who've done much of the analysis and development of the VO, uh, VOR monitoring project. We have Joanne, which I don't have a bio on, I'm sorry, so I'll let you talk about yourself, introduce yourself. Carrie, FAA Eastern Region uh, Monitor Program Manager and responsible for the implementation of the MON in the Eastern U.S. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to these folks. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, after playing our national anthem, just want to take a couple of minutes for some thanks. Some thanks for our wonderful country, uh, the freedom uh, to fly, uh, the, our blessed country, as, as I said, with, uh, with, with aviation and, and all of the thrills and benefits that it brings to us. Also thanks to EAA for inviting us again uh, this year. And also thanks to you all. I kind of sound like a Delta captain when I say this, but we know that there are so many places to go here and so many things to see and so many wonderful forums to attend. And so thank you very much, bright and early this morning on Friday, for coming in to hear the three of us talk about the VOR Minimum Operational Network. Where do I? There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Um, this morning's agenda, a uh, couple of items to, uh, uh, to cover with respect to the uh, operational network. The first will be the VOR-MON operational plan. What is the plan? What is the FAA planning to do um, with the VOR-MON operational program? Um, what are we doing to ensure within this operational plan that in the case of a GPS outage that you, uh, unlike airliners, will still be able to navigate whether you're in a GPS outage or not, you can still use the VOR MON network um, even with or without um, a GPS outage. The next program and accomplishments. Um, we're still a relatively new program as compared to some of the other uh, programs within the FAA, but we have accomplished a great deal in the short time that we uh, have been initially funded. We're also going to tell you a little bit about the program timeline to give you some sense of where we are right now and where we're going towards uh, the, the final decision of uh, in 2025. Also talk a little bit about airliner operations doing a, a GPS outage. While our focus seems to be with the VOR MON program, what can we do, what are we doing for predominantly GA or non-DME, DMA aircraft, there are also uh, some areas that we would like to inform you with respect to airline operations doing a GPS outage as well. VOR MON methodology. How did we develop the criteria that we, uh, that we are utilizing to determine which VORs we will decommission? Um, what's the service volume as, as we indicating in, an, in another item? What, is, what are the changes to the service volume? But, but only the methodology area. How did we get where we are how do we arrive at the decisions that we're making with respect to which VORs will be decommissioned? Also looking at VOR MON equipment and filing requirements. You may be aware with so many of the other FAA programs such as WAS or such as ADSB, there are some requirements for equipments, um, equipment changes, but with the VOR MON program there are essentially no equipment changes or any changes to filing requirements. We're also going to talk about new VOR MON standard service volume. We know that uh, with the current system, we have certified at least 40 nautical miles. We had promised and certified at least 40 nautical miles from, from a VOR. Um, you'll see in this particular area that we've kind of uh, put VOR MON on steroids, that we're actually going to be guaranteeing uh, 70 nautical miles rather than the previous 40. Also, some, uh, what, what we're doing to chart VOR MON airports. Um, for the most part, uh, in identifying or charting VOR MON airports, you won't see anything specifically in, let's say, um, VFR charts such as, such as sectionals. Most of the charting changes you will see in IFR, low altitude, high altitude en route. And also, uh, finally, removing a VOR. 
what is the criteria that we're using, what is the process that we're using, what's involved in actually removing the VOR. And then our, our summary. So with respect to the VOR operational plan, um, for those of you that are familiar with performance-based navigation plans, the FAA administrator's plan, we have so many things going on, so many programs within the FAA, so many strategic as well as tactical plans. The one assurance that we have made with respect to integrating and implementing the VOR MON plan is that we are consistent. Within the FAA, one voice, one message, uh, and consistency within the performance-based navigation plan uh, with, with the VOR operational plan as well. Support the NAS transition from VOR-based routes to a more efficient PBN structure consistent with next-gen goals. We also are promising that with the VOR operational plan, we are enabling pilots to revert from performance-based navigation to conventional navigation. You're flying with GPS, then, uh, uh, then uh, you fly through a particular area where there is not GPS. Most GPS outages are short-lived and are generally in smaller, isolated areas. So we are enabling the pilots to continue uh, navigating within the GPS outage area utilizing your conventional nav aids. Yes, sir? Will this material be available as a handout so I don't need to take notes? <laughs> yes, and, and we do, and I should have mentioned this, we also have um, some handouts, some flyers on the bottom. And um, audios uh, of all of the, the uh, presentations that you hear, not just here, but also in all the forums, in, um, in the forum area. You can also receive audios of those. I think it's uh, in the rear of Forum 7. Uh, you're able to, uh, to get audios of these as well. Any other? Okay. All right, thank you. We're also enabling pilots to tune and identify a VOR at a minimum altitude of 5,000 feet above ground level or higher. You'll see um, a, a, a more in-depth discussion about that uh, when we start talking about the new service, um, service volume. Also enable pilots to conduct VOR navigation through a GPS outage area or you can continue to navigate to a Mon airport within 100 nautical miles of where you first encounter um, the GPS interruption. So you can continue, if, uh, when you do have a GPS outage, you can continue navigating VOR by VOR, whatever the VORs are that are available, or um, you can land, uh, as we guarantee, we're, we're guaranteeing at a VOR Mon airport within 100 nautical miles. We're also enabling you to fly uh, at this airport, this 100 nautical miles, to fly um, VOR instrument approach without GPS, DME, ADF, or radar where, where it says where the capability currently exists. In addition, we're enabling pilots to uh, navigate along the VOR airways, especially in mountainous terrain where MEAs um, make the um, excuse me, where, where they make direct to navigation um, impractical. Um, we are looking at, in, with the operational plan, discontinuing approximately 30% of the VORs by 2025 in accordance with FAA Order 7400.2 and established policies. Well, what's going to happen in 2025, Joanne? We will, at that point, reevaluate how the program will continue, if we will discontinue any more VORs. So that's still quite a few years away. Uh, but there will be another major decision made in 2025 with respect to how we proceed from there. Uh, the, one, the other um, assurance with the implementation of the VOR MON program um, is that we will continue complying with standard navigational aid removal procedures and circulation that we've been applying uh, all of the years uh, up to the VOR MON program where we have had to, for whatever reason, discontinue a VOR. So there's nothing different about what we have done in the past. Um, we are going to make sure that the, stan as we say here, the standard navigational aid removal procedures and circularization will be completed prior to initiating the VOR's discontinuance. Program accomplishments. 
with any program within the FAA, we have a, a, a great deal of, of preparation, um, requesting funding and so forth before any program is implemented. And with the VOR MON program, we successfully received approval to begin implementation in September of 2015. We have conducted extensive coordination, extensive outreach with um, aviation organizations such as RTCA, with federal government agencies such as the Aeronautical Char uh, Charting Forum and numerous aviation user groups such as AOPA, NBAA, um, ALPA. Uh, the outreach um, has been considerable with respect to uh, what we do with the VOR MON program, how we're going to implement it, also which VORs will be, uh, will be dis discontinued or decommissioned. Another accomplishment, we published the VOMON Implementation Program Final Policy FRN uh, in July 26, 2016. We have copies of the FRN um, here in the front afterwards if you'd like to come up and get some copies. We have um, published the VOR Concept of Operations as a part of the April update to the AIM, the Aeronautical Information Manual, and that was in April of 2017. And to date, we have discontinued uh, the 10 VORs that are, are listed. Um, you'll find that the VFRN that's, um, that's in the handout up front, that that also has a list of the VORs that we are intending to discontinue. And with that, I'll turn it over to my coworker, Carrie. My Thank Carrie. you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Joanne. Um, just to kind of give you a, a little information about our uh, plans as far as the timeline for uh, implementing the MON, uh, you can see the years and the, and the marks there. Um, some, the, the external drivers that we're talking about, um, the, the WAS LPV procedures. Ultra, my, okay, and, uh, and the ADSB equipage mandates are both uh, uh, highlighted there. Um, because having more options for space-based procedures uh, and, you know, I think we all understand that ADSB is in fact a, a de facto GPS mandate. And I don't know a single pilot that I've ever talked to who wants his airplane to know more than he does about where he's at. So, um, yeah, you can buy a little box that'll broadcast your position, but, you know, everybody's got a handheld it may not be certificated, but you can use GPS a lot of different ways. Um, the MON is really focused in on uh, uh, instrument operation. Obviously, you can use VORs for VFR, but you can use a lot of things for VFR. So if it's there, by all means, help yourself. Uh, but we're really focusing more in on instrument operations um, because you've got to have a primary and a backup means of navigation. So GPS is vulnerable. So if you lose that, what's your backup? And if you don't have an FMS and scanning DME, it won't be RNAV. So these are, these are really the reasons that we are doing this whole effort. So you can see we started out with a total of 957 VORs. Uh, we're targeting to go down to 649. Those numbers may change by onesie twosie kind of digits uh, over time. Uh, VORs are all old equipment, and you know we may have a critical failure that we can mitigate by other than replacing that VOR. So, um, and even in in the in the Federal Register notice, um, there was a list of the ones that we were planning to get rid of, but understand nothing is cast in stone. Um, and we've had a couple of occasions like where we've added one VOR that we thought we needed to keep. It turns out we really don't need it. So, um, you know, the numbers, the numbers are not solid. But anyway, so you can see we're, we're starting to ramp down. It's kind of a, 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 not really an exponential fall off, but we're starting small because we're having to work out a lot of uh, process things and and the biggest piece of it I mean everybody knows that a VOR is a piece of hardware but really it's the airspace and procedures work that is the largest piece of the VOR MON effort taking the hardware out you can just go off and turn off the switch once you've done the required paperwork 
but you can't do that until all of the dependencies on that VOR have been removed. So um, that's one of the reasons we're starting slowly with this. Uh, the pr processes for implementing uh, performance-based navigation procedures are, are fairly new, and those are also ramping up. So there's, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that you know, the, the piloting world doesn't necessarily see. Um, but anyway, so we, uh, we took out, I think, five last year. Uh, we're going to do something in the neighborhood of a dozen this year. And then, you know, we'll be trying to ramp up. And really, we'll be ramping up until we saturate the procedures people. Uh, there are a lot of other things changing in terms of next gen and uh, the Metroplex areas. So they, they've got a huge workload, and we can only carve out so much of that for, for the VOR mine. So that's it. What button do I push, Joanne? Is it, is the right. It forward? The right. What do I point it at? Ah, there, yeah. hey, that was easy. <laughs> okay. So um, just to talk a little bit about airlines, because you know we all have to get on a commercial plane once in a while. Um, so most all of the airliners uh, are equipped with uh, DME DME uh, RNAV capability. Um, right now, they have a, a requirement. Uh, for an inertial reference unit to, to bridge the gaps in the DME network. Um, but we're working on that. Oh, sorry. Um, anyway, so we're, we're assuming that, that most people will have a DME, DME RNAV as their backup. Uh, in fact, in talking with some of the airlines, uh, with all the mergers and acquisitions that, that you've all heard about, um, you know, you, you acquire the, the hardware from from the mergers and put those two together. Some of these guys inherited some old airplanes and some of those airplanes don't have the full capability, but they're also all planned to go away in the next few years as, as newer aircraft uh, come online. So we're trying to work with them uh, to ensure that by the time they need it, uh, they'll be all uh, equipped. So uh, we're not really talking about DME navigation in particular but there's a program coming Mike. along that, that's going to be filling in the gaps on, on the DME network uh, across the country so that at, at least initially, at least en route, they'll be able to fly uh, DME, DME navigation all the way and they'll have a, a completely uh, intact backup. So, you know, we'll, even if you totally lost GPS, which we're hoping doesn't happen, but nonetheless, uh, we're covered in that, in that, in that eventuality. So just to show you what a removed uh, VOR looks like, uh, this is a Princeton, I think that's Maine, um, yeah. and you see the open box there. We took the VOR away and we left the DME. So the DME only is now charted. Uh, you still get the VOR frequency because if you're actually tuning it, you tune the VOR frequency and the DME is slaved to the VOR head. So we have to publish the VOR frequency even though there's no longer a VOR there. So uh, this is the, the VFR and the IFR examples of that. So uh, that that's, should be pretty straightforward. Oh, went too far. Jumping all over. Okay. As far as methodology is concerned, is this, was this, is this where you start? I or? think so, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, right. I'll let you do this. This, is right. your, this is your stuff. <laughs> all right. So. So, you know, the idea is if, if we're going to get rid of VORs, uh, actually a, about, 10 or about 15 years ago, the FAA proposed to just get rid of some VORs. They were broken. And uh, I think AOPA rightly pushed back pretty hard on that and said, you know, we'll support getting rid of some VORs, but not just because they're broken. Let's have a, let's have a methodology of what we're trying to get to. So what we tried to do was come up with a plan of of how to how to get rid of reduce the number of VORs and and have a, a background behind it that made sense for us, for the principal VOR users. And like Kerry said, most of the airlines really don't use VORs. They're using DME, DME and ILS. But but we're the big users. So the thought was if we're trying to protect against the GPS outage let's be able to land. 
all right? And so we came up with this idea of let's have a landing field at least within 100 nautical miles. Now, 100 nautical miles is not necessarily the requirement for an alternate, depending on the speed of your aircraft. Yeah. If alternate fuel is 45 minutes, but it at least gives a reasonable alternative to landing. Another thing, too, is it may be that you don't need to land, that you want to just go through any outage. Okay? You can do that also. So the idea was let's choose airports so that you have a landing site within 100 nautical miles. Now, most people, and my airplane's just like this, I never bought a DME for my airplane because the FAA allows me to use my GPS for it. And I never bought an ADF for my airplane because same thing. So let's, a lot of people don't have DME and ADF right now. So if we're going to have this safe landing airport or landing airport, Mon Airport, and we're going to land at it with a GPS outage, let's not make any approaches depend on ADF or DME. Okay? And we also said, look, you know, if, if worse things happen, you, you generally got radar, and radar's nice to have, the controller can help you out, but you know, if, if the controller can't help you out, then let's be able to do it without radar too, okay? Now, again, you're having a bad day already if you have to use all this stuff, but we wanted to make sure that the, the low, kind of the low-end GPS, the low-end GA airplane that only has a VOR backup can use this mod. And so that, that's what it was. Uh, we also, for a number of uh, uh, legal reasons, decided to retain VORs uh, that support international routes. We didn't do Canada and Mexico, but the East and West Coast Pacific and Atlantic routes were retained. Uh, then we said, look, you got to get to these approaches. So let's keep enough VORs where if you got to 5,000 feet above the ground, not necessarily in the western mountainous area, but in the rest of the U.S., that you could navigate. Most all airplanes can get above 5,000 feet above the ground. And, and you can navigate to, to one of these safe landing airports. Um, but in the western mountainous area, that doesn't work very well. I mean, you know, if the, if the ground's 10,000 feet and you've got to get to 15,000 feet, that doesn't work. So basically, and you'll see on the charts I'm going to show you in a little while, that we kept almost all of the VORs in the mountains. Uh, that also allows, a lot of the VORs are placed so you can fly down a valley and, and get lower MEAs. So most of the VORs in the western United States were kept. Um, we did not try to get rid of VORs in Alaska or Puerto Rico or Hawaii. There's not very many up there anyway, but that was not part of the program. And uh, we also only worked with FAA VORs. A lot of VORs are owned by states and some of them are owned by private entities, but we, we couldn't really depend on what was going to happen with those VORs. So on, the, the network was developed only using FAA VORs. If those other VORs are available, of course you can use them. Um, li like Kerry said, when, when a VOR is decommissioned, if there's a TACAN at the site, so it's a Vortex site, or a DME at the site, a VOR DME, the VOR is taken out of service, but the TACAN and the DME generally will remain. Uh, if, if, the, if the site is in bad shape or they're losing the lease or something like that, sometimes the whole site disappears. That's a separate issue. Um, and also a lot of the VOR sites, actually almost all of them, have some kind of communication facilities. And also the VORs transmit the HIWAS uh, messages. I don't know anybody that really uses HIWAS anymore, but they're there. So those are either relocated or put in a, a consistent uh, service. So those, that service is going to remain. So that was the idea behind it. And this is kind of how we did it. So we, we went through and selected airports within 100 nautical miles. The, now, so each of these circles is 100 nautical miles. And uh, e each of the green circles are around an airport that has an ILS. So we tried to do ILSs where we could. And again, all of these approaches have no requirement for DME, ADF, or radar. 
Okay. Uh, where we couldn't do an ILS approach, we did a VOR approach. That was just what was available. Okay. There's a few places out here, there's no approach there now. So we didn't try to add in approaches. Okay. So this was the first step. We said, where are landing airports going to be? And that's what it says, 133 ILS airports and 59 VOR airports. Okay. I, I, I didn't have a chart up here this year, but the airports have, they have pretty good infrastructure. Most of them are pretty long runways and, and things like that. So I think the shortest runway of any of these is about, is about 4,500 feet. Okay. So that, that's, that's pretty good airport infrastructure. Uh, then we said, how about keeping VORs so that we can get to these airports? Well, like I told you, in the Western Mountain area, we kept pretty much all the VORs. That's pretty much as it is today. One big difference with this chart, though, is like Joanne mentioned, we extended the service volume of the VOR to 70 nautical miles. So how did that happen? Well, it turns out that the power that the VOR generates, and I think we all know this, can be received outside the, the 40 mile service volume that the FAA currently guarantees. But the way they structure VOR frequencies, you can get co-channel interference and things like that. So what the FAA is doing is redoing frequency assignments for VORs and also testing power levels. There's a lot of flight tests going on. And we're, we're right now extend, it, it, it hasn't been done yet, but it's in the process of extending the, the service volume of the VORs to 5,000, at 5,000 feet to 70 nautical miles instead of 40. And I'll show you some more slides on that lately. So, so these are the international VORs that we kept, and these are the Western Mountainous Areas VORs that we kept. And then we said, okay, how about retaining the VORs that support those ILS and VOR approaches at the Mon airports? So we did that. These are all them. Now, of course, you can still see we got a lot of areas here with no, no coverage. So we said, let's add in some coverage there. Okay. So this is now what it looks like in the U.S. There's still a couple of spots, I'm sorry, still a couple of spots where we have small outage areas and we figure we can just coast through those. There's not, not that much. And again, we, we all know you can receive a VOR more than 70 miles away, so that we don't think this is a big deal. Also, all these areas have, have radars. The areas here that don't have coverage, there's a couple of things there. For one thing, 5,000 feet AGL is, is pretty high, and there's no coverage there already, but we're keeping almost all of the VORs out there, so that's pretty much the existing service. So that's what, that's what it looks like. Yes, sir? Uh, hold on. Just uh, hold on. Let's go get your mic here. On? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you're going to get a few questions from me because I'm from Canada and I'm representing our equivalent of AOPA on a committee okay, that's good. with NAV Canada and Transport Canada on just this same subject. And my first reaction is we should have you guys up talking to <laughs> our next uh, CPAT meeting. Well, let me just say do that. That, uh, yeah. I, that we would be happy to do that. Yeah. Okay. I well, mean, we can discuss Joanne's that talked offline, about the outreach program. Uh, we have shared this information with NAV Canada and Transport Canada, and I, I can't speak for the FAA exactly. I'm not an FAA guy, but I guarantee you that that, yeah, that would we'll be accepted. But I try to do much the same exercise on my own. Um, okay. One of the problems has, has been identification of the final approach fix. So will that be possible by uh, an intercepting VOR radio in, in these ILS sites? Every one of the ILS and VOR approaches, we kept sufficient VORs to identify the initial, the final, and the missed approach fixes. Yes, sir. That was part of the criterion that were, the criteria that we used. So yeah, yeah. Well, you can do this approach. We kept the VORs so that you can do the approach. Okay. All right. So that's that's kind of what the the coverage looks like now, and uh, this is this is what's going and what's coming. So the orange ones are the ones that are, are on the candidate list to get rid of. Uh, the, the list is in this Federal Register notice that was published last year. You can get this online or we have some copies up here. Okay. Uh, 
You can see that most of the VORs are in the central and eastern U.S. and that's because because of these mountains here we kept most of the VORs in the west. Okay. Uh, now what does this mean to me as far as my airplane goes? Uh, you can make a case, well do you have to plan for a GPS outage? Well. You know, right now, today, if you have a WAS receiver in a Part 91 aircraft, not a Subpart K aircraft, but a Part 91, that's all you have to have. So if you lose GPS, you're going to do the best you can with your compass and your clock and your radio and maybe a little rosary beads and all. But, uh, but that's the requirement right now, and that requirement is not going to change. So the FAA is providing a VOR MON service in case of a GPS outage, but you are not required to carry a VOR. You are not required to plan for a GPS outage, and you're not required, like I said, to even use the MON. Now, is it a good idea to do that? Yeah. And the service is available. And so, but that's, that's back on to you as the pilot in command of what you want to consider. And the truth is, like I said earlier, if you have to use this VOR MON, actually, you're, you're kind of having a bad day. I mean, we just don't have that many VOR outages, and most of the ones we do have, actually almost yes. all of them, are published in a NOTAM by DOD. So, you know, this is, this is a network that's being provided by the FAA for, for use in the case of a VOR outage, and GPS. you can use it or not. Um, the, uh, if, if you're a 91 subpart K or you're an airliner or an air taxi, you have a whole set of operating regulations that are different than the part 91 people. In general, you have to have two forms of navigation. They have to be independent and one of those forms of navigation has to be independent of GPS. So that gets kind of complicated and gets right down into your operating certificate. So we're not going to really talk about that today. although. If, if you had a question about it, we could probably answer some of those. So no change in equipment requirements and no change in filing requirements. All right, I think that's kind of good news. Um, this is the new VOR service file. Well, this is the old one. It uh, was 40 nautical miles here, but now it's going to pop out to 70 nautical miles as soon as you get to 5,000 feet above the VOR. Now, you say, hey, suppose at 5,000 feet I got icing or something and I can't cruise there and I'm in a GPS outage. Well, darn, you know, it's just having a bad day here, um, having a worse day. The, the truth is, is that there's actually pretty good coverage down here. And, you know, if you have an icing and you can't climb to 5,000 feet and you need to get somewhere, what do you do? You do what you need to do and there's good coverage down there. Mm -hmm. so, It'd be nicer if we had extended service volumes below uh, 5,000 feet, but apparently that's not going to happen. But the actual service is there. So if you, need, if you needed to use the MON and you couldn't get the 5,000 feet AGL for, for something like icing, you can still go. There'll still be coverage there, uh, even though it may not be within the standard service volume. Uh, I thought this was kind of interesting. This is all 900 and what, 67 VORs that we have today in the uh, National Airspace System in CONUS with their 40 mile service volume. And you can see there's, there's lots of areas here where there's, there's no service outside of the service volume. If you took out the 308 VORs we're getting rid of and extended the service volume to 70 miles, it looks like this. So the truth is, the, the, the coverage within the standard service volume is actually getting better. Okay, so what this does, oh, I'm sorry, you had a question, I didn't see, I'm sorry, excuse me, I, well, I was looking over there. Yeah, no, uh, hi, Vince. Um, so the, uh, I mean, the coverage is not better, it's just you've de redefined the service volume. So, yeah. yes, I, I, I agree, yeah. I agree. But anyway, so I think the big issue that a lot of us are seeing is that there's no redundancy anymore. You know, when you've got the more complete network and all that, if you have an outage, which happens a lot, um, then you, uh, 
you know, you've got other VORs that you can rely on, but now since you've got, uh, you know, a much reduced cut volume of uh, VORs, you, you know, if you have one outage, then you're not 100 miles or 200 miles or some number like that. Yeah, right. Okay, so that's a real good question. Can address? I jump in there on that one, Vince? It kind of, go ahead. It's where I live. Uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the reality is that, you know, VORs are old equipment and they're old technology. Uh, we have issues with encroachment. A lot of times we built a VOR when it was built, it was in the middle of nowhere. Well, now there's a subdivision backed up against it and the neighbors are complaining and um, well, that's one of... It was out in the middle of nowhere too when it was built. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's it. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and, and so, you know, that, that's kind of a universal problem. Um, we are doing the best we can with what we've got to work with. Obviously, we, you know, it would cost billions and take forever to replace all the VORs. And given the way technology is going, that solution doesn't make any sense. Um, it is going to become more important uh, to check NOTAMs uh, if you think you're going to end up using or if you know you're going to end up using VORs. Um, and yeah, you might have to do some rerouting if a VOR in the MON uh, does fail. Um, we, we are recovering all the equipment from the sites we're shutting down, which builds up our spares inventory and hopefully will give us a uh, shorter response time. And, and uh, time to repair, uh, we have different classes as far as what the technicians are required to respond to, and, and we're evaluating that also. Right now, we've taken out very few VORs, so you know, the expanded service volume is something that we've proven, you know, but basically you've got what you've always had right now. So as we're pulling VORs out and getting closer to the, the reduced network, um, we are going to be looking at uh, restoration time. Obviously, you can't do anything if a tornado knocks one out, but if it's, if it's a failure that just requires a repair, uh, we're, we're looking at, at increasing our uh, response time uh, or increasing our response ability and thereby reducing uh, our restoration times. Uh, it's still going to take uh, a month or more to replace a roof. So uh, those outages are planned and we actually have a strategic outage committee so those NOTAMs can get out a little farther. Um, is VOR navigation going to be what it's always been? No. Uh, is there going to be potentially some inconvenience associated with the MON? Yes. The MON was intended to be kind of like a navigational system of last resort. Um, and, and it's not perfect, but it, it's, it's a whole lot better than just turning off every VOR in the country and saying figure it out, which is not what we're doing. Okay. Let, let, me, let, me, let me add to that. I'm going to back up a little bit because I, I really didn't cover something I should have. So thank you very much for the question. So this is the same chart where we had the Mon airports. Okay. And like I said, each of these airports has an approach that you can do with a VOR, ILS, and no radar, DME, and uh, no ADF. Okay. There's way more airports than are here. Okay, so you're right. I mean, this, this is the kind of the bare bones backup. This is it. This is the service. But there's lots more service out there. So if there's an outage and you can't get to that airport, there's still plenty of airports you can get a radar vector to or things like that. So, so there's a lot of different redundancies that are not shown here. But I appreciate what you're saying. You know, there's not going to be as many VORs. There's not going to be as many airports that you can get to without GPS. That, that's undeniable. Completely agree with you. But there's a whole lot of stuff you can do that's not shown here. I mean, it's just, if we put all the ILS airports on here, in this area here, you can't even read the little three-letter identifiers because there's so many airports there. Mm -hmm. Can you get a radar vector to that ILS? Yeah. If that ILS requires DME, it's not on here. But if you have a DME in your airplane, you can fly the approach. So, except you have ADS-D, which is dependent on GPS, so now there's down primary radar. 
Okay, now, yeah. uh, ADSB is a good question. If, if you have a GPS outage, you're going to lose ADSB. Um, the FAA has a whole other program on keeping SSRs so that if there's a GPS outage, the controller will still have radar. Okay, now there are some places where there's ADSB is going to be the only surveillance. And when you lose GPS there, there's no surveillance. Now, before the FAA can do anything like this, these big programs, they have to do a safety analysis. Sometimes that safety analysis is a one-pager because it's kind of a no-brainer. This was not. This was about 40 or 50 people, controllers, pilots, uh, uh, facility people like, uh, like Kerry, the whole nine yards going through different scenarios. And yeah, there's some places where, ah, darn, not a good day. But you can also, there's other ways and other mitigations we could have. So this met a pretty rigid safety analysis, but you're absolutely right. Some of the redundancy is going away, and that's part of life here, you know. I, I personally think that this is kind of a neat thing that the FAA is doing. I mean, our, our, our colleague here from, Trent, from uh, Canada, you know, we don't know, we don't know what Canada's plan is, but the FAA is keeping enough VORs, so it's A, you have a backup for GPS, but you know, a lot of people are putting in ADSB and the, the, the GPS chip is in the transponder. So you don't have an official GPS in the airplane to navigate with. You've got an iPad or a handheld, but you don't have a, a panel-mounted GPS. Well, shoot. But they're not flying slant golf. Pardon? But they're, not flying. they're not flying slant golf, but they can still fly. So they can go VOR to VOR. Now, it may not be quite as direct as it is today, but there's enough VORs to do that. And so I, I kind of think this is a, a, a good thing the FAA is doing. They're leaving enough VORs where the people who have not in, invested in a WAS or a regular panel-mounted GPS can still fly. And the people who have GPS can, can have a backup in case GPS is gone. So I, I mean, it's a pretty good balance. But like Kerry said, the, you know, let's face it, the you know, last major VOR buy was in 1974. So in 2025, most of the VORs are going to be at least 51 years old. So we've got to do something. And like Kerry said, pull these VORs out, they're keeping those parts. And uh, so I think the response will be better on keeping VORs up. And that keeping VORs in an up status is a big issue. That was part of the safety analysis. And that's part of the emphasis is on making these, these things work well. Okay. So good question. Thank you very much. All right, let me get here. We're, I think we that, that, did that, we did that. Okay. Um, now, Mon Airports. I think we were going to turn this back over to Kerry. Is this one yours? Oh, I'm still talking. So still this still is the same slide I showed before with the Mon Airports. <laughs> and uh, this is how they're going to be charted. Okay, first thing, they're going to be called a Mon Airport. <laughs> it, it, it's kind of funny. We, 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 when we originally started this, we called them safe landing airports because there was an airport within... 100 miles, and you know, people started complaining. It says, well, if these are safe landing airports, are the other airports unsafe landing airports? So we changed the terminology, so it's MON. And this is going to show up in a couple of ways. It's going to go into the chart supplement, which everybody knows is the AFD, but now it's the chart supplement. It, they're going to be listed in there, and uh, they're going to be noted with this kind of, 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 uh, uh, marking on the IFR charts. Okay, they're not going to be on sectionals or things like that. We figure if you're using a sectional, you do that. The neat thing, though, is that they're going to go into the database with Mon Airport. Okay, so that means that the people who are doing four flight and Garmin Pilot and all that can search on that. And so if you're looking for Mon airports, the provider for the, for the tablet you got, that's something that can be pretty easily searched for and brought up. So we don't have it right now, of course, but, because it's new, but we, we feel like that the service providers for most of our tablet software are going to be able to pull it up to where you can look at the Mon airports very easily. 
And of course, you can look at them in the paper books now, if anybody uses paper anymore. So that seems like a pretty good idea. So that's what it's going to look like. It's going to look like this on the FAA charts. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how Jeppesen and, and the other chart providers are going to uh, provide them, but it will use the term MON, and uh, it may be in a slightly different color. You know, that they use different colors. Now, this is a yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this is the guy that actually pulls them out of the eastern region. So he'll well, talk about. Well, I'm, I'm I'm definitely in the loop. It's not, it's not a single-handed effort by any means. Um, so you know we're, we're talking about the mon and pulling out you know hundreds of VORs, but the reality of the system is, uh, in order to decommission any charted facility in the FAA, we have a process that we go through, and it's it's our discontinuance uh, decommissioning process um, and that requires a non rulemaking study non rulemaking studies mm -hmm. involve circularizations so and that's that's both an internal uh, within the FAA we circularize uh, all of the stakeholders the flight procedures people uh, the the operational folks uh, and we say we want we want to pull this particular thing it doesn't have to be a VOR. We want to pull this out of the NAS. What is the impact? And if the answer is no big impact or it's going to do this to us, then we look at what could be mitigated. Uh, like, you know, we're, go we're going to lose a crossing radial. Uh, we're going to lose, I'm pulling out a lot of uh, uh, outer markers and locator outer markers right now. And in some cases, it's like, well, we're going to lose an initial approach fix. So. The question is then, well, what can we do to mitigate that? And sometimes the answer is, well, you have to install a DME on this localizer. Um, you know, so we, we look at all of that, and we also send uh, notices out to aviation stakeholders. You may, you may see one of these posted on an airport bulletin board because the airport manager got a copy of it. Um, so we, and so we, we look for feedback from the public. Um, it, it, if it's a flight school and they're going to have to change the way they operate, there's not much we can really do about that. Our mission is to support aviation, not to support a flight school. So uh, we get a lot of that. That's why I mention it. Um, but anyway, so we, we take all of this feedback and we look at all of these impacts and then we look at mitigating them. Uh, and you know, for the VORs, I, I think I said this before, it's really <laughs> airway and procedures impacts. So if the VOR is going away and there's Victor Airways going through it, those Victor Airways are gonna have to be looked at. And the airway changes are an actual rulemaking process and they get published in the Federal Register uh, and that's kind of a long drawn out process. Uh, so first they have to do the design then they have to do the publication. And they, they also have to evaluate their feedback uh, the response requirements are more formal for rulemaking than for non-rulemaking. Uh, but anyway, so it can get to be a long involved process. Um, right now, I have already submitted requests for, doc, uh, for decommissioning of all the VORs in the eastern United States that are on my waterfall through 2020. Now, that they haven't all gone uh, circularization yet because I created a backlog, so they're working through it. Uh, but in reality, once I get the documentation to approve it, it can take three years for all of that mitigation work to take place. So if, you, if you're a close watcher of especially instrument charts these days, although airways are on the sectionals, uh, you may have already noticed that these are very busy times in the airspace world. Uh, there's hardly a chart cycle that comes out without some significant uh, changes. And uh, if, you, if you start to notice that a VOR is looking kind of empty, well, that's the mitigation process at work. Now, we won't actually turn the VOR off and take it off the charts until all of that work is completed. Um, and, and what we're hearing now is because of the way the process works, the, the actual VOR symbol won't disappear off the chart until the cycle after the one in which all the dependencies have been removed. Um, and that includes fixes. 
and we really don't have an excellent database for fixes. We've got the airways, we've got the procedures pieces. Uh, we're, we're finding out that, oh, gee, we missed a fix, and so we have to go back and, and create a mitigation for that. Uh, but anyway, so we're, we're working through that, and we work through that for each individual VOR. Now, there are one or two cases where we may work, uh, at, in the east, I have a lot of very high density stuff, and there may be two VORs that are only 15 miles apart. We may work those two together if they're both going away because there's a third VOR 20 miles this way, and that's the one that's staying. So we, we are trying to get some efficiency. Uh, we're also trying to only have to touch an airway or a procedure one time. So if, 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 I'm, if I've got it come up on my list because of VOR number A, but I know that B and C are on the list, we'll go ahead and do the mitigation for all three and so that way we don't have to keep going back and revising the same stuff over and over again. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of a quick overview of, of, of that internal process. Yes, sir. We have a question down here. I did. Yeah, I know. I'm, waiting. I'm t saying that so the guy with the microphone can come back. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so actually two different questions here. And if you're Eastern region, so when I fly back east, you're always on an airway and all that. I mean, you know, so you, right. file, you file direct and they always put you on, a, they always put you on a Victor Airway. Um, right. And it seems like going around New York airspace, they put you on one set of, you know, VORs going in eastbound and one set going westbound or so. Um, so I'm not sure how they're going to be addressing that with taking out, you know, you are taking out a lot of VORs in the east, northeast there. Right. And then I got a second follow-up question. Yeah. I'll just. I, I'm not out. really sure. I see that as a question. So can you can you like clarify well, I, what I think, the question I think part the, is? The answer I, is the answer for New York is very late in the game because <laughs> the New York airspace is really the most complex airspace in the entire country. Exactly. You know, we've got three core airports practically on top of each other, and then a ton of satellite airports around it. So they have a very carefully worked out layered structure and that's why they put you on airways mm -hmm. is because they really don't have any alternative because there's other airplanes using that other airspace. So um, we've kind of always kind of said we're going to hold off on that until we've got a lot of practice. Um, and the, the, the performance based navigation people are very involved and they're in discussions with New York right now about how to, how to start tackling that problem, but everybody realizes that's the biggest, trickiest area that we've got to deal with, and so we're, we're, we're already starting to work on it, but the implementation of that won't really get going until we've got an overall plan. Yeah. So the just airways are probably going to be less so, but you may, you know, you may be assigned waypoint to waypoint. Or T routes. Uh, key routes, yeah. There's a limit to how many key routes. routes we can do, but there, you know, there's yep. more of those popping up every chart cycle too. Sure. No. So if you're GPS equipped, you can do T routes. Right. But if you're non-GPS equipped, then what are you going to do? How are you going to handle that traffic? So there's what's going to happen? Traffic in yeah, that area. The, the ATC facility in New York, but other ones, have to figure out how they're going to handle their traffic, and they know their traffic pretty well. They know the VORs that are not going to be there. So it'll be a combination of working with the existing VORs, adding T routes, or, or if they're high altitude, Q routes, and also um, looking at point-to-point -point navigation. So there's a lot of work that has to be done. And like Kerry said, that's the long pole in this tent, is all that work. So that I, like I said, that's, well, that's fine for GPS equipped. If you're non-GPS equipped, then how are they going to navigate through that airspace? They're going to have to figure out how to handle non-GPS equipped aircraft. And that, that, would, so that was my question, yes, is how are they going right. to do that? Right. Yeah, yeah and, and um, just I, I didn't talk about it before, but, but our flight procedures teams in, in uh, Atlanta have, have had uh, coordination meetings with all of the major air traffic facilities all, all up and down the East Coast. And we've, we've basically already given them the list and said, here's what your airspace looks like now. You know, here's what your VORs that remain are going to be. Um, you know, this is coming. We're going to need to work this out. So at least they've already had a heads up. 
And in some places they go, yeah, no problem. And in other places they're like, okay, we're gonna have to get together and work on this. Um, so since it hasn't been done yet, I can't tell you what it's gonna look like, um, but there, you know, there will be VORs. Um, they won't be 100 miles apart or, you know, in, in New York. We're taking a lot out because there's so many there now. Um, but even if you look at the VOR Mon and try to draw those circles, you see those circles overlap quite a bit. So you will have maybe radials assigned to fly uh, or, you know, a, a direction to fly, to fly to the intersection of, you know, fly this radial till you intersect another radial. It may not be a charted Victor Airway, although, you know, we're not making them all go away. If there's a VOR, you can have a, a Victor Airway. But, but we, we, we don't have all that worked out, especially for the New York area, but we have already started working on it. So I had a question down here. I can probably say this because <laughs> I'm not official, but I, my impression is that within 10 years, an aircraft without C-146 GPS aboard will not be a practical IFR flying machine. And, Let's just say we're, it will be less efficient. You, you, you can say we're, that. We're, yeah. We've managed. I mean, I, I learned to fly in 1970, and VOR was in place then. In a in a world of where it's been marked by technological change, we're still flying with the same technology we were 50 years ago. We've just been exceptionally lucky, and I don't think that that uh, ability well, hey, to continue. Some of us are still using propellers. Imagine oh, yeah. <laughs> those, those, those are distinct price and Scotsmen but, uh, all fly propellers. Yeah, I mean, uh, we haven't come up with a real good alternative for wings either, but you know, um, so there's certain things that are basic to flight and, and, and some requirement for navigation is part of it, um, but it's just that as the technology has evolved, you know, we're, we're at least starting to look at getting rid of it. And, you know, uh, I, am, I am pretty much telling everybody right now is, you know, once we get to the Mon, plan on keeping it to at least 2045. And if we're gonna have VORs beyond 2045 or 50, we need to be looking at buying some new VORs because 70 year old electronics is not reliable. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but technology is, uh, is. Uh, we're actually in the Windsor to Quebec City corridor. If you want to look at that part of your chart, which is on the American uh, en route charts, there's nothing but blue. It's all tango routes. <laughs> uh, you can almost look at that and, and regard that as a model of the shape of things to come on yeah, the way well, to steel. Yeah, well, I mean, for serious IFR, you know, like, business aviation or commercial aviation. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. You know, it's gonna be GPS and, and, and RNF. Yeah. And, and that's all, I mean, it's almost there now. I mean, we're, we're looking at over 90% you know, of the traffic is that. So, you know, there are some holdouts, you know, there is some legacy equipment that is being phased out. They're just not done yet. Um, I think Delta has got about two more years before they'll be 100% RNF capable uh, because they inherited a bunch of MD-88s in the, in the merger uh, with Northwest. I'd, I'd like to just add, with, with respect to Canada and, and our neighbors Canada and Mexico, with respect to the outreach that we've conducted, um, we have not as the United States unilaterally, we're not unilaterally decommissioning VORs or routes that do affect Canada or do affect Mexico because Canada and Mexico also use our VORs and vice versa. So we have, um, again, with outreach, um, and, and as part of the coordination process that Vince and Carrie are making reference to, we are well aware of the, the um, the impact on both Canada and Mexico with respect to decommissioning some of the VORs that you use. Okay, so since this is going to be a backup system to the GPS system, are, are you going to have, obviously you're going to have to have higher MEAs for IFR flight with the service volume that you're talking about. Are there going to be two MEAs, one for uh, lower when we're using GPS and one for higher if you're using the Victor Airway? I honestly don't know 
I mean, I'm, I'm so focused on the VOR portion of this, I'm not directly involved in the, the GPS piece of the airways. Um, it's a good air traffic question, I just don't know the answer. Um, Wait for I'm, the sound of freedom to pass you. <laughs> it's, um, it's entirely possible, I mean, you know, there are places where it's really flat, and there, there's a lot of IFR traffic below 5,000. Um, but I'm not sure how much of that is really en route. You know, I mean, you know, in the terminal area, you're ultimately going to end up at, at zero altitude uh, AGL anyway. So that's kind of a different case. And but, uh, I like I know Florida. Yeah, people are zooming around at you know 2,000 feet all the time because it's so low. Um, the uh, the truth of the matter is we're keeping a lot of VORs in Florida. We're only getting rid of four in all of Miami uh, Center's airspace, uh, and they are working on a Metroplex right now that I'm not intimately connected with, um, but I do know that we're kind of holding off. Let them get that fixed. Um, so, but, but the answer to your question is yes. We, we already published GPS MEAs on some airways. Uh, whether that'll be, you know, like Kerry said, the, the structure of what's going to happen when you pull out all these VORs and what airways are left is still being worked on. But I would anticipate that you're going to see more GPS MEAs on the VOR airways that we, pub we publish them now. And I'm sure that they're going to be continue to be published. And where it's advantageous, I'm sure they'll have GPS MEAs also. So I have a question over here, too. Uh, to, your, to your right. This is uh, kind of a minor point, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, the entire VOR DME network was replaced in the 90s. Uh, the reason I know that is I was a DME product manager at the vendor that did the replacement. Now, I left the company in 1997, so I don't know if what happened after that, obviously, but uh, if you're thinking about replacing the equipment with new equipment, you might want to accelerate that because the engineers like me that know VOR and DME are all retired. <laughs> well, I think uh, the information I had was the last major buy of VORs was in the, in the 70s. Now, with the, the DMEs were replaced. Yeah, you're, you're talking about the third gen system? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, anytime we buy VORs, we buy different configurations, and so you can have a VOR only, and those are actually pretty rare, and they're only used in the terminal environment. Um, you can buy a VOR DME. Uh, or you can buy a full Vortac, which has got, you know, the military TACAN associated with it. And, and that's what we buy the most of. Um, there, what, most of the equipment that we have right now is what we call the second gen VOR system. And that's what Vince is talking about. There was a procurement uh, for a third gen system. It was not wide and extensive. It was kind of an experiment that the... Uh, FAA, I mean, we certified the equipment, we bought some, uh, and we're still using some, but third gens are relatively rare within the FAA network. Um, we've always had training issues because it's a different type of equipment, and the technicians have to be certified, you know, in order to work on it. We never developed the in-house training course for that, so you, you still have to go back to the vendor to get that training. So within the FAA system, it, it's a bit of a, a sore thumb, but it does exist. So I'm not, you know, but it, it's not a big factor in what we're doing. And it was not a factor in the selection. Uh, one of the third gens that we decommissioned, uh, we stuck it in, a, in storage. So it's there if we need a third gen to pull out. But, but generally within the FAA, they're not very popular, especially among our support technicians, because it's a whole new system that they have to be trained on and maintain currency on. So, so yeah, I take your point. Um, I've actually, we've been working with our training academy, which is where all of our technicians go. It's in Oklahoma City. Uh, they have just redesigned their VOR training course 
you know, because we always have technicians who get promoted uh, and they go on to other things and then we have new technicians coming in and they have to be trained and certified on the equipment that they want to support. So well, we've just reduced the, the length of that course from three weeks down to two and, and added a whole lot more lab space so that we can support training for those technicians. And we can do that because, you know, the, the maintenance philosophy has changed. We no longer troubleshoot anything down to the component level. You, you troubleshoot it down to the card and replace the card. And then that goes back to the logistics center for possible repair. But, you know, you replace the card and you put the system back in service. So our maintenance philosophy has changed and that enables us to be a little more responsive and not have to train to as much detail. So anyway, I'm gonna move on to the next slide now because we're running out of time um, and, and we're kind of wrapping up anyway. So uh, just to kind of summarize, uh, the MON uh, will, be, will be a backup uh, during a GPS outage for people who aren't equipped uh, to use RNAV. Uh, you can either transit the outage uh, or you can land at Amman Airport. Uh, you don't require GPS, DME, ADF, or radar. Um, if you're not equipped with GPS, you can still operate in the NAS based on the MON. may not be as efficient. Um, it might be more convenient to go VFR because there's not, no restrictions on that. Um, but either way, we're not changing equipment requirements or, or filing procedures. So that's uh, that one, and I think there's one more. Um, so we're reducing, we're reducing the network. The MON should be established by 2025. Um, that, that will be your backup if you lose GPS, uh, I said, and if you're not RNAV equipped. Um, there is an email address, a telephone number, uh, and a web link provided there. Um, and uh, they, they go directly to the VOR MON program manager, and then they get kind of, depending on what the question is, it'll, it may get routed to somebody else. Um, and we're using, the, for removing the VORs, we're just using our standard decommissioning process uh, and methodology. So we're, you know, we're touching all the bases and meeting all the requirements that are associated with that for, for removing anything, not just VORs from the NAS. And so, so there's two handouts up here if you're interested. Uh, this is uh, just one that describes the MON. This is the Federal Register Notice, which you can also get on those websites. And it has all of the candidate VORs in there. And I have a set of my business cards here. If anybody wants to give me a call or talk, I'd be happy to do that. So, All right. And any more questions? we got about two minutes left, I think. So. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot for coming, and I enjoyed the show. Thank you very much. And, and, and thank you all. And there's, there's wings and over here, too, if you want wings credit. <laughs> <laughs>